would uh, turn it to Acts chapter 18. Uh, that's the passage we're going to look at uh, today. Uh, so we'll just really, as we've done in previous weeks, we're just going to go through the chapter just verse by verse. Uh, so rather than take time to uh, read the chapter now, uh, we'll just really read uh, highlights from the chapter as we make our way uh, down through it. Um, I really thought in verse number one, we've got uh, Paul's departure from Athens. Uh, so most of my headings this afternoon are going to begin with a letter, the letter D. Uh, so we've got Paul's departure from Athens. It says in verse number one that after these things, Paul departed from Athens and he came uh, to Corinth. And last Sunday afternoon, Callum looked at uh, the events that took place in Athens. And I suppose, um, humanly speaking, that um, Paul's uh, visit to Athens didn't seem, on the surface of things, to be particularly successful. Uh, it seems that he was mocked and, and ridiculed by these wise philosophers or uh, philosophers that thought they were wise. And, and he was kind of scorned and scoffed at. And it says that he, at the verse 33 of chapter 17, tells us that he departed from among them. And verse 34 says, How be it certain men clave unto him and believed, and names one or two uh, people at the end of chapter number 17. But that really just seemed to be it as far as his missionary endeavor uh, his evangelist, evangelistic efforts in Athens were concerned. It really didn't seem to produce much fruit. And I suppose there's times in all of our lives just like that. You know, we would love to be in co constantly in the good of revival, uh, where the, the saints of God, our hearts are being revived and, and full of the love of Christ and and knowing that the, the presence of Christ and the power of Christ in our midst, and we would love to see the overflow of that in the communities and, and just to see people being saved on a regular basis. Uh, and that's what we long for and desire. But you know, that is, that is not the normal. And that certainly wasn't the normal even for, for Paul the Apostle. And he goes to Athens and it seems as if his activities there for God are in comparison to other places, they seem to be they seem to be fruitless. And so he leaves Athens and he he comes to he comes to Corinth. Um, it's interesting that at Corinth there's a there's a good start. Uh, in fact, everything is really encouraging as far as the the city of Corinth is concerned. He's there for eighteen months, as we'll notice as we go down the chapter, and there is tremendous fruit and there's. Uh, tremendous um, activity and there's a, the establishment of a, of a church and, and virtually no opposition. He's not getting thrown in prison. He's not getting dragged through the streets. He's not escaping for his life. He's got 18 months of relative calm. And during that time, God is moving and there's a, a work being done and a church is being established. But, you know, I suppose when you come into... Uh, to come to read 1 Corinthians, Paul's letter to the Corinthians, we'll notice if there were very few problems at the start of the work in Corinth, there was certainly plenty of problems after the commencement of the work in Corinth. And you know, I suppose of all the epistles that Paul wrote uh, to the various churches that he, that he either had planted or he knew of, then this, the church at Corinth seemed to be fraught with a whole multitude of problems, more than any of the other churches. You will notice there were moral problems in Corinth. There were marital problems. There were tribal problems. There were procedural problems. There was doctrinal problems. There were social problems. There was legal problems. There was gas gastronomical problems. Problems about what they were going to eat and what they weren't going to eat. And of course, there was there was problems with betrayal. That even in the church of Corinth, a place that Paul had labored in for eighteen months, there were those that turned against them and said that his 
in, his, the, in relation to his bodily presence and his speech that was contemptible. His bodily presence was weak and his speech was contemptible. And so all these problems emerge after the church has being established. So it was established without opposition, but there was, there was plenty of problems and issues as the church, uh, as the church grew and as the church matured. Uh, Corinth was, Corinth was a, a city of great importance in, in Greece. Uh, it was situated ge geographically in a, in a kind of peninsula, a kind of offshoot of land. And the, either side of that, that offshoot of land, that peninsula, there was a harbour. Uh, so whether boats were coming from the east or from the west, there was a, a, a harbour that was available for them to, to, to berth in and to unload their wares. And there was a city that was just ready and willing to trade with the, 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 the traders that, that made their way uh, to Corinth. It was a wealthy city. It was a, a city that was marked by a tremendous amount of commerce. And sailors were coming and going. Traders were coming and going from both sides of the city. A city where there was so much, it was a hive of activity. And with the wealth, and the commerce and the finance, there came, there came vice and there became immoral, immoral, immor, immorality. Uh, indeed, it was so much so that there was a, a, a verb was, was actually uh, conjured up as, as based on the name of the city. And it, people spoke about being Corinthianized. And to be Corinthianized was really to be marked with a, a life of, 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 of sexual immorality, a life of profligacy. Uh, it, was, it was a shameful thing to be, to, be, to be referred to as one who had been Corinthianized, one who had become like the people of Corinth, people of low moral standards. So we think of what it was like geographically and we can think about its wealth, what it was financially. But we think what it was as far as immorality was concerned. And we can think too of what it was like religiously. You know, it was the place where there was the temple of Aphrodite. And associated with that temple was the, uh, a priesthood of priestesses who were basically temple harlots, temple prostitutes. So lasciviousness in the city of Corinth was not just practiced in the, in, the, in, in, the, in the darkness of people's homes or in the back streets or around the port, but it was something that was openly practiced in the very temple, at the very heart of the religious life of Corinth. There was this sexual immorality associated with the prostitutes of the temple of Aphrodite. And much of the wealth of of Corinth was derived not only from the trading by the ships as they came and went from east to west, but much of the wealth of the city was a result of the, the money that was exchanged in the temple for the use of these temple prostitutes. And so it was a, it was a city that was, was wealthy, was luxurious, and yet it was a city that was, was dark and a city that was sinful and shameful. We could think of what it was culturally. You know, it was every four years the the uh, the, the Isthmian games were 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 held in commerce in, in Corinth, and the athletes would come from all over all over Greece, and they would compete for their prizes uh, in these Isthmian games in the city of Corinth. And of course, as we read Paul's le letters uh, later on in the Bible, we'll discover that he. He draws from the imagery of these games. Uh, he'll look at, them, look at himself as being a boxer and he, he'll think of himself and others as being runners striving after the prize. And no doubt in the course of Paul's sojourn to Corinth, he would see the evidence of, of the Isthmian games and these athletes that were striving for mastery over their own body and were striving for the crowns the incorruptible crowns that were given at the games. And on top of that, it was marked by 
uh, its philosophies and it was marked by its, its art and Corinthian bronze was well known and well noted for its excellence throughout, throughout the world. And so that was the kind of city that Paul visited. It was a city that was the very antithesis of, of the, the very philosophy that, that marked Paul. It was the very opposite of his own lifestyle. It was something that was contrary to all that he stood for. And yet here he is, a lonely figure, arrives in the middle of the city of Corinth, a city where everything was contrary to what he believed. And yet he came there, a lonely man, and yet coming in the name of God and with the message of God and with faith in God and with hope in God. As there he makes his way from Athens down to the city of Corinth. I thought in verse number two and three, we've got a divine appointment, a divine arrangement. It says in verse two that he found a certain Jew named Aquila, who was born in Pontus, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome, and he came unto them. And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them, and wrought for they by their occupation were tent makers. And so, isn't God good? <laughs> so here's this lonely figure arrives in this massive city with all its hustle and bustle, with all its, its sexual immorality, with all its vice, and he arrives there, and God already has someone there to befriend him and to encourage him and strengthen him. You know, I think one of the things that we really see in, 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 in this chapter, uh, Acts chapter 18, would really bring before us something of the, the, the frail humanity of the Apostle Paul. You know, sometimes we think about Paul and we think he was a, a kind of superman. We, we think he was up and beyond the, 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 uh, the, the fears and the, the feelings of normal mortals that somehow or other he was able to ride all the storms, that he was able to rise above his circumstances, that he had some kind of uh, super support mechanisms to isolate himself and shield himself from all the pressures and the persecution. But you know, I think in this chapter, we really, we see the humanity of Paul. We see his frail humanity. He comes into the city and he's lonely. And, you know, God gives him someone to befriend him. And, you know, he comes into the city and he's, he's penniless. And God gives him a companion with whom he can labor and whom he can work, with whom he can work with his own hands to provide for his own needs. Well, notice later on in the chapter, he, 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 seems, to be, he seems to have lost his courage. Uh, he's the man that stood up in Mars Hill and, and, and fearlessly uh, proclaimed the, the truth regarding the unknown God and who the unknown God and, 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 and commanded men on behalf, uh, and on behalf of God, commanded men to repent. And yet we discover that he just seems to be, he seems to have lost that courage and that timidity until we discover that in, in uh, verse number, verse number four, uh, Verse number five, that Silas and Timothy come to him from Macedonia. And it's after Paul, uh, Timothy and Silas come, that Paul seems to be able to uh, get that wee bit more boldness and that courage. Uh, it talks about him being stirred, his spirit being stirred within him. And he then declares that Jesus is the Christ. Later on, we see them, we see that he's fearful. And God appears in a vision and God speaks to him directly. Uh, and, and he tells him in verse number nine, he says, don't be afraid, but speak. Don't hold your peace. So God steps in to, to reassure him, this frail servant of his. You know, remember Paul says to the Corinthians, he says, when I came, he says, I, I, I came with weakness, I came with fear, I came with much trembling. And we see that in the chapter. You know, sometimes we expect uh, those who serve the Lord to be, to be on a plane that's kind of higher than the rest. 
uh, and able to uh, just endure all the storms, just to stoically face all the pressures and all the suffering, to rise above it all and to be unaffected by it all. But Paul felt the loneliness of the journey. He felt the isolation. He felt the, the burden of things. And, and he needed to be encouraged. He was encouraged by the friendship of, 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 of Aquila and Priscilla. He was encouraged by the, the fellowship of, of, of Silas and Timothy. And he was encouraged by a direct word from the Lord that, in, that, 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 that enabled him to continue in Corinth for the space of a year and a half. You see, God knows, God knows how his servants are. Doesn't he only know where they are, he knows how they are. He knows our feelings. He knows that each one of us are but frail mortals. And he understands and he provides for us. He provides for us. Praise God for the provision that we see by the sovereign hand of God providing for Saul, uh, for Paul, as he visits the city of Corinth. You know, Aquila and Priscilla are interesting, an interesting couple. They're really mentioned uh, six times in, in, in the New Testament. We get them mentioned twice in Acts chapter 8. They're mentioned again in, in uh, chapter 18. Uh, they're mentioned again in Romans chapter 16 and then 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and then 2 Timothy chapter 4. And it really seemed as if there was a, there was a bond of friendship that was developed between Aquila and Priscilla and Paul that lasted Paul's lifetime. Because even in 2 Timothy, Paul's last letter, as he's, as he's in prison in Rome, awaiting the executioner's block, and as he writes to Timothy, he sends greetings. He sends greetings to Aquila and Priscilla, a friendship that was a lifetime, lasted a lifetime, a friendship that meant so much to the Apostle Paul. You know, it's amazing just the, you know, the ways of God are just past finding out. You know, it's just amazing that you've got Aquila and Priscilla at the beginning of this chapter. And, and, and then at the end of the chapter, in verse number 24, we've got, we've got Apollos uh, from Alexandria, a Jew from Alexandria in Egypt. And, you know, it's amazing how God just interweaves the lives of different individuals from different backgrounds and just organizes the circumstances of life to bring people together in order that they may be united in, the, in, the, in, the, in, in his work and the furtherance of his purposes in the world. And that's amazing. You know, think of what it says about Aquila and Priscilla. Uh, it says they were just lately uh, come from Italy uh, because Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome. It's amazing how we see the human and the divine linked together. They were there because Claudius had thrown the Jews out of Rome. But, you know, they were there in, in, in Corinth, not just because of a, an edict from a, a earthly monarch, but they were there because of the sovereign movements of God placed in Corinth just prior to, to Paul reaching there in order that they might, be a, a, they, they might be friends with them, in order that they would receive him into their home and that they would be a support to him in his work, in his ministry, in that city. And brothers and sisters, we, it's good just to remind our hearts of the, the sovereignty of God this afternoon, that God moves behind the scenes, and God's doing his work. You know, where did these folk, where did these guys hear the gospel? Who, who brought the message of redeeming grace to, they, to them? Where, how, did Paul, how did Apollos, at the end of the chapter, from Alexandria in Egypt, how did he hear? How did he hear about the Messiah and, and, and that the Messiah was, and that Jesus was the Christ, albeit he only knew the baptism of John? Isn't it wonderful just to know that God is working right throughout the broad, oak, broad acres of the globe? working silently and yet working surely, accomplishing his purposes, tying everything together, moving hearts here and there, moving individuals from one place to another just to advance his purposes in the earth. 
Brothers and sisters, we are associated with a sovereign God, an almighty God, a God whose purposes can never, ever be thwarted. He's working out his purposes moment by moment throughout the whole of the world. And ultimately that he will be glorified in all things. And he knows our need. He knows, he knew Paul's need. He knew exactly what Paul needed at that very moment in time as he entered as a lonely servant of God into that vast, immoral city. He knew what he needed and waiting for him. It says he found him. He found a certain Jew. He found him. How did he find him? He found him because God directed him to him. And Paul, Aquila and Priscilla would be that support and help to him. It's interesting that Aquila and Priscilla are always mentioned together on the six occasions in the New Testament, always mentioned together. Three times Aquila and Priscilla Three times Priscilla and Aquila. And, you know, I really thought about, I thought about their life. And, you know, you know I thought about their hospitality. They were, they were sharers in hospitality. They opened their home. They opened their home to Paul. You will discover that when Paul writes to them uh, in, in 1 Corinthians 16, they hadn't only opened their home to Paul, they'd opened their home to the church. It speaks about the church was as in your home. Our oh, brothers and sisters, how important it is to open our home to the saints of God and the servants of God and to share hospitality, to have fellowship with brothers and sisters that we may encourage each other on the path of service for the Lord Jesus. I thought not only of, not only of the, uh, the, the hospitality, uh, but, you, uh, uh, but I thought you know, of, their, of their unity. Their unity. They were marked by unity. They were, it was always Priscilla and Aquila. And it's good, you know, when husbands or wife are, are united in the, in the service of the, of, of the Lord, have got the same desires, the same ambitions, just longing that, that God would be glorified in their lives and in their home, laying all that they have at the feet of God and asking God to use it. Use our home. Use all that we have for the furtherance of your purpose. And they were united in that. You know, I thought as well of their, of their, uh, their, their, their spirituality. Not only the spirituality of Aquila, but the, the spirituality of Priscilla. You know, when Apollos came, to, uh, came to, to Ephesus, at the end of this chapter, there was things that were, that were missing in his understanding of divine truth. And it was Priscilla and Aquila took him into their own home. And they together, together, husband and wife, male and female, they expounded to him the way of the Lord more perfectly. How wonderful. What a beautiful couple. What an example for every uh, Christian couple to be, just to be like Aquila and Priscilla, to be like Priscilla and Aquila, to be marked by, by unity, to be marked by hospitality, and to be marked by to be marked by uh, by spirituality and that that ability uh, to uh, support others and instruct others in the ways of God. And so we see this mingling of the divine and the human. As I mentioned already in verse number two, that that Claudius had commanded the Jews to depart out of out of Rome. And, 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 and they arrived by divine decree, not just by the decree of Claudius, but by divine decree, they're there at the, at, the, uh, at, at the right time, at the right place. And, you know, we see that throughout Scripture. We remember in relation to the birth of the Lord Jesus, it was under decree, it was under a human decree that Mary and Joseph had to make their way uh, to Bethlehem because of the census that had been arranged by the authorities. But they were there not just by human decree, but they were there by divine decree. Because the Old Testament had prophesied that Bethlehem Ephrata would be the place where Christ would be born. We see again in the Old Testament in relation to the recovery of the, the people of Israel from Babylonian captivity. That God had stirred up the heart of Cyrus, the king of Persia, and he made a decree. But it wasn't a Cyrus's decree. It was a God-given decree. The time had come when God would restore his people. Brothers and sisters, let's rejoice. Let's take comfort. Let's fix our faith on a God that is absolutely sovereign, who's working all things together 
according to the purpose, his own purpose, and for his own will. And so we see uh, the fact that, uh, that Paul found him, and then he became friends with him. And, and then we see the, the finance, that, that they, were, they were both tent makers. You know, what's the chances of that? You know, finding someone, Pontus is in uh, a kind of similar area uh, geographically to, to Tarsus. So they were kind of from the same area uh, and were from the same Jewish background. Uh, and, and they were there in the city of Corinth at the same time. And, and lo and behold, they've got the same occupation. <laughs> you know, this is, this is divine. This is sovereign. This is the, the preordained purposes of, a, of an amazing almighty God. Brothers and sisters, we can trust them. Even when we don't see, we just see a jangled piece, uh, a pile of, of, of pieces of a jigsaw. But you know, God has got the, God is able to pick up the pieces and, and just slot them into the right place at the right time just to create a wonderful picture that glorifies himself. And brothers and sisters, we can rest four square on the purposes of God uh, this afternoon. And they were both tent makers and and, and that's, how, that's how Paul made his living. That's how he was supported there in Corinth in the initial part, at least, of his, of his visit there. And, and, you know, that is, that is a, a valuable lesson, isn't it? You know, really, as servants of God, servants of God should be free from any, any taint of suspicion in regards to money. You know, sadly, the service of God uh, nowadays in the broad or evangelical world has become a means of making money, making money. And yet here is, here is the Apostle Paul, and he's making money for himself, not through his preaching, but he's making money by the very, by the very labor of his own hands and by the sweat of his own, of his own brow. You know, the Apostle Paul had no... Uh, uh, no mission body that he could turn to for support. Uh, he, he never sent any appeals for money, but he labored, he worked with his own hands to support himself and support the ministry there in Corinth. What a lesson. Remember, he says to the, the Corinthians, he says, when I was present with you and when I was in want, I was not a burden to any of you, but he worked and he labored with his own hands. You know, the problem of finance has been the downfall of many a servant of God it has blighted their ministry. And we see the excesses all around the place. Brothers and sisters, beware. Beware of any preacher that appeals for cash. <laughs> really beware of any person who, who preaches for money and appeals for money. And here's the Apostle Paul, who had every right, a laborer is worthy of his hire. That is true. But no laborer, no laborer can demand, can demand, no servant should demand to be supported by others. If others support in the ministry, then that is an exercise from God and should be an exercise from God. But no one should ever appeal for money for the service that they do. And Paul was in want. And rather than appeal to others for cash, he would labor with his own hands to support himself in the ministry there in Corinth. Notice verse number four, we've got the debate in the synagogue. Uh, it says he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greek. Reasoning in the synagogue, persuading. You know, everything seemed to be quite low key. Everything seemed to be kind of amiable that Paul went into the synagogue where the learned men were, the rabbis were, and, and, and he was able to communicate what, from his own personal experience, from his knowledge of the Old Testament, and they just kind of discussed things. You know, that is different from, you know, where he, you know, the previous chapters. You know, when Paul goes into the synagogue and kind of causes an uproar. But, you know, there's no uproar, not at this point in the synagogue. They're just discussing things. They're discussing, maybe he's just laying a basis. Maybe he's building up, uh, building up relationships and, and building up uh, some measure of, of, uh, of, um, of uh, approval among them. But, you know, it just all seems to be kind of low-key. 
until we discover in verse number uh, five and six, Silas and Timothy comes and things change. He just seems to be lifted up in his spirit. He just seems to be, to have captured uh, somewhere as a result of their fellowship, a, a greater degree of boldness and courage. Uh, and so we see that in verses five and six, rather than just reasoning and persuading, we'll discover he gives a direct application uh, to the word that he's been reasoning about and he's been seeking to persuade them about. It's a direct application. Uh, you know, it says in verse number, uh, verse number five, and when Silas and Timothy were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. No doubts about it, no arguing, no persuasion, no reasoning. A direct application, a direct statement. Remember, he could write to the Corinthians, and he said, when, 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 I, when we came among you, I was determined to know nothing among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And we see in this verse, the, not only the, 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 the fellowship, the fellowship that he had with, with Silas and Timothy, men of like mind, men that had been through trials and suffering along with them. And he just seemed to derive boldness from their company. And so he gives this direct application of the word to the hearts. He challenges them. He doesn't just reason with them, but he challenges them in relation to the identity of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he is the Christ, he is the Messiah. And the implication of that to these Jewish people was absolutely and utterly immense. And so he seems to receive a new uh, life and a new vigor in his ministry. You know, think not only of the fellowship that he had with them, think of the fire, the fire that just seemed to burn in his heart and burn in his bone. It says, you know, he was pressed in his spirit, pressed in his spirit. Remember at Athens, as he stood alone in Mars Hill, in verse 16 of chapter 17, it says, the spirit stirred in him. The spirit stirred in him. Uh, but here is the idea, being pressed in the spirit. Or some translations put it, he was constrained by the word. The word, the word of God was living within him as a constraining power, compelling him to give utterance to it. He could not hold his peace any longer. He must declare it. He stirred. It's constraining him in the very depths of his being, and he must give utterance to it. He must express it. Remember, he could write, woe is unto me, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. I am debtor, I am debtor to the Greeks. And the, he, must, he must tell it forth. Oh, brothers and sisters, that we might know something of that burning within our hearts, being constrained, constrained by the love of God, constrained by the word of God, constrained by the spirit of God. And just, just having to give utterance to it having to express it and express it with fire in our very bosom. Brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters, I don't know about you, but I like a preacher with a bit of, a bit of fire in him. And not just, not just, not just persuasion and, and not just reasoning, but, but, you know, bringing the message home with, 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 with power and, 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 and directly to individuals' hearts preaching with the very fire and very power of the Holy Spirit, preaching from our hearts, preaching with conviction, preaching in order that men and women would be challenged about their relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul's message, the message that God had laid on his heart, gripped his heart, gripped his heart and held him and forced him to deliver it. He must make known this message there in Corinth. You know, it's interesting, not only the fire in his bosom, but the focus in his words, that Jesus, Jesus was the Christ. He wasn't even messing around. He wasn't even telling uh, wee, wee stories. Uh, you know, he, he wasn't even, you know, he, he was in earnest about it. This wasn't a sermon preaching. But, you know, he was, he was preaching not only with a fire in his bosom, with a focus 
and he was directing men and women's attention to the glorious person of the Lord Jesus. And the only hope for salvation was in Christ, in Christ alone. Brothers and sisters, in our declaration, in our testament, this world, this world doesn't need religious philosophy. This world needs a fresh presentation of the person of Jesus Christ and all his uniqueness and in all his saving power. We need, the world needs Christ. And brothers and sisters, we need to preach him and we need to preach the cross and we need to preach the blood because in that, there is hope alone. There is hope for the salvation of precious souls. And so Paul is focused on his preaching. But notice the reaction. You see, previously when he's reasoning and persuading, there's no reaction. It's all amiable. It's all low-key kind of stuff. You know, there's a reaction. When he focuses in the fact that Jesus is the Messiah, Jesus is the Christ, he's the promised deliverer. He is the one in whom there's salvation. Not in religion, not in the law, but in Christ. And we notice that they opposed and they blasphemed, it says in, 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 in verse number Verse number six, they opposed themselves and they blasphemed. And we notice Paul's, Paul's reaction to that as he forsook them, as he turned his back on them. It says he shook his raiment. He said, your blood be on your, on your own heads. He says, I am clean. I am clean. And he says, I go to the Gentiles. Paul had given them their opportunity. Paul was absolutely confident that he had done all that was expected of him to do as a servant. That he could stay there in their midst no longer. He discharged his responsibility. Remember the words of, of Jehovah to Ezekiel in the Old Testament. He says, warn them from me. And if you warn them from me and they, and they, and they, 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 they don't repent, then he says, their blood is in their own head. But he says, if you don't warn them, then their blood is in your head. And no doubt Paul's got that in his mind as he writes these words. I've warned you. I've told you the truth. I've discharged my responsibility to you before God. And the onus is on you. The responsibility is on you. And he turns his back and he leaves them. He leaves them there in the synagogue. Brothers and sisters, there's times when we just need to leave people. We just need to leave them where they are. We just discharge our responsibility by preaching the word, by pointing them to Christ and leave the Holy Spirit to do his work and drawing them to the person of Christ and bringing them to repentance and bringing them to faith in the Lord Jesus. There's only so much we can do. There's only so much we're asked to do. We're simply asked to preach, to preach the word, to preach Christ. And to preach Christ crucified. And the Holy Spirit will do the rest. The Holy Spirit will bring men and women to the, into the experience of the new birth. He'll bring them to Christ. And we see that. We see that in the next verse. Verse 7, it says, He departed from there, and he entered into a certain man's house named Justice, one that worshipped God, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house, and many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. And so as a result of Paul leaving the synagogue, we discover there were people from the synagogue that trusted Christ as their savior. And among them was the leader of the synagogue, Crispus. And not only him, but his house, and many of the Corinthians hearing believed were baptized. There was an effectiveness. Paul didn't flog a dead horse. But, you know, when Paul realized that the ear of the bulk of the people in the synagogue was against him, was close to him, then he departed from there. He moved away. And maybe it was through moving away that some of these individuals realized, realized the urgency of the message. You know, sometimes we've got to remind people that God will not always strive with men. That we need to remind men of the, the urgency of making a personal decision for the Lord Jesus, of repentance. It's not something they can do at their own leisure. It's something that they must do as the message is presented to them and as the Spirit of God works in their hearts. And so Paul moved away. And then moving away, there's fruit. There's fruit in the preaching. 
And maybe we need to have that sensitivity to the working of the Holy Spirit. Maybe there's times where we've got to walk, walk away from certain people in certain places. Maybe we've done all we can. Maybe we've done all that God has asked us to do. You know, sometimes I feel in our Christian service, we just flog dead horses. We just cast perils before swine. We just continue in a certain ministry, in a certain work. And rather than, rather than just abandon it, you know, some people say, well, it's faith. Faith keeps us going. Maybe it's pride that keeps us going. Maybe it's pride. Maybe we're involved in a ministry that we have started or the local church has started and we don't see any fruit, but we keep persisting. Maybe it's pride that keeps us persisting. Maybe it's no faith. And maybe we need to be sensitive to how the Lord is leading us. And there comes a time when we must depart, just as Paul departed uh, from, from the synagogue in Corinth. And his departure resulted in fruit. Not his ministry in the synagogue, but his departing from it resulted in fruit. And many, many heard, believed. And we're baptized. Brothers and sisters, that's the pattern. That's what we long to see in Oaken Lake and, and all the different churches represented in this call. Oh, that we might see many hearing. How shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they preach except to be sent? Oh, that we might be willing to be sent. And oh, that we might be willing to preach. And oh, that there might be men and that, that are willing to hear and to believe. To believe on the Lord Jesus and to be saved and to manifest that. Manifest their faith by being baptized, by being identified with Christ and his death, his burial and resurrection. Taking that stand, that stand with Christ in his death and resurrection. And so we notice that he departs and he, he departs knowing within his heart that he has, that he is clean. He's clean. He's done all that God has asked him to do. And he's clean from the blood of these Jews in Corinth. We notice verses 78 continue, or speaks about his departure from uh, the synagogue. Verses 9 to 11, we've got this divine assurance, this, this divine vision uh, that, that really just comes to Paul just to meet him where he is in his own heart. In spite of all this that's going on, eh? in spite of this blessing, uh, many hearing, believing, being baptized, and yet Paul's discouraged, Paul's down, Paul's timid. Uh, and it says, uh, verse 9, then spoke the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision. Don't be afraid. You know, someone says God doesn't waste his visions. You know, God doesn't just appear in visions here, there, and everywhere, in every circumstance of life. You know, God, does, God, God, God is specific and God sees a need in the heart of his servant. And so he, he, he intervenes personally to minister to that need. And that need is not only to calm his spirit, his troubled spirit, but that vision is to challenge him and to command him to speak forth. Don't hold, don't hold your peace, Paul. Don't be like you were earlier on in the chapter. But, you know, just, just recapture that boldness. I command you. I challenge you. Be calm in your spirit. Fear not. Speak forth. Speak forth the word. And brothers and sisters, maybe there's times where we need to hear that. I need to hear that. There's times we do get discouraged. We go, there's every reason for Paul to, to, to get discouraged. You, you, know, you, you think, you know, of, 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 of all he's been through. Uh, since the very minute that he arrived in, in Philippi, when he crossed into Europe. You know, he ends up in the prison in Philippi. He, 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 goes, to, he goes to Thessalonica and he's, 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 he's hounded out the city. Uh, he goes to Berea and needs to make a hurried escape as the people from Thessalonica uh, come after him. Uh, the seeming failure of his, of his missionary endeavors in Athens and and his loneliness as he entered the, the, the streets of the city of Corinth. And it's all got to him. Because he's human. And it all gets to each one of us. We're all human. We need to remind ourselves at times of our humanity. Our frail humanity. And we're subject to all the stuff that the people around us are subject. And all the servants of God 
that we put on pedestals and almost worship. They're just made of the same stuff as ourselves. They're men of light passion. And, and here's, here's, here's Paul, the apostle. Yeah, there was times when he was caught up to the third heaven. There's times when he can rejoice in the, in the deepest dungeon, sing praises to God at midnight. But there's other times, like now, when he's in fear, he's in distress, and he's discouraged, and God intervenes. Praise God for his kindness. God intervenes just to encourage him. And maybe you're where Paul is in this verse. Maybe you are now where Paul was in, in, in Corinth. And maybe you need to hear the words of the Lord tonight. Fear not. Fear not. Uh, don't be afraid. Speak. Don't hold your peace. Tell forth the message. Tell forth the message of grace. Tell it forth to others, to your neighbors, to your friends, to your family, to your workmates, to your schoolmates. Tell it forth. God is giving us that command, not only to speak, but he's giving us an encouragement that we're not to be afraid. Why? Because he says in verse 10, he says, because I am with you. I am with you. Brothers and sisters, the almighty God, the God who created the universe, the God who gave every single star its name, knows your name, knows your circumstances, knows your fears, knows your discouragements, knows your depression. And he says, listen, I want to tell you, I am with you. I am with you. Brothers and sisters, right where you are this afternoon, right in the midst of the trials and difficulties of your life and the disappointments and the discouragement, the Lord is there. He knows your name. The one that named the stars knows you and knows your name and knows your circumstances. And he says, listen, I am with you. But then he gives them, he speaks not only about his presence, he speaks about his promise. It says in verse 10, he says, No man shall hurt you, but I have much people in this city. Twofold promise. Nobody's going to hurt you here. <laughs> you know, he spent the last X number of months getting hurt. You know, being persecuted, being hounded from pillar to post. No matter it was to be imprisoned and all the rest of the stuff. He says, listen, that's not going to happen here, Paul. That's not going to happen here. I'm going to preserve you here. You know, nobody can, you know, I was thinking about the Lord, you know. There was times when men wanted to cast him over the brow of the hill. There was times when they took up stones to kill him, but, but he was under divine protection. Brothers and sisters, we see the same thing here. God gave Paul 18 months of respite uh, in, in Corinth, respite from the, the sufferings and the persecution of the people. And you know, God knows, just the point I just want to make is God knows what we need. God knows what we can handle. And maybe at this point in his experience, Paul couldn't have, Paul maybe couldn't have taken any more suffering. Maybe, maybe he'd reached his limit. And God says, listen, I'm going to put a hedge around you for a wee while. And for the next 18 months, he says, I'm not even, I'm not even a finger going to come upon you. There's nobody going to hurt you. And he says, more than that, he says, because I've got much people in this place. You know, the Lord knows those who are his. The Lord knows those who will be his. And it's through his work that those who are his become his. Brothers and sisters, the amazing sovereignty of God that Paul is able to rest on. And Paul is able to continue his preaching knowing that his labor would not be in vain, but God was going to draw out of the city of Corinth. City of Corinth, with all its vileness and its vice and its immorality, Paul was going to draw out of that city a people for himself. Brothers and sisters, I wonder as I look over Auckland Lake this evening, I wonder how many people does God have in this place? How many people does God have in this place? Now, I know there's a few that gather with us in the, in the, in the, in the Auckland Lake Christian, Christian Fellowship, those that are his. But I wonder, I wonder about those that those in the community that, 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 that God has, that God has ordained unto salvation, that God's hand is upon them, that God will draw unto himself in days that are yet to come. Oh, brothers and sisters, just to get the vision of God over our communities and just to realize that it doesn't matter how dark, spiritually dark our communities might be, that that if God could draw a people for himself out of Corinth, he can draw a people for himself out of Auckland Lake and all the communities round about him. 
he can draw them out for his glory. And Paul was a part of that. Paul was a part of the drawing out process as he went and as he preached the gospel. But, you know, we noticed that he was there for a year and a half and, and he's preaching in the light of the presence of God and the, and the promises of God. And, and then we notice that there is that opposition rises. Uh, but it's amazing how it is how it is quelled, how it's just all brought to nothing. Uh, you know, it says that the uh, and when Gallio, verse twelve, when Gallio was the deputy of Achaia, the Jews made insurrection. They rose up with one accord against Paul, and they brought him to the judgment seat, saying, "This fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law." And when Paul was now about to open his mouth, he was going to open his mouth. God had told him to be bold. God had told him to speak. And so he was ready to speak even before uh, Gallio, as, as well as his opposers, he was willing to speak. They never get a chance to speak. It says, Gallio said unto the Jews, if it were a matter of wrong, if it was a crime that had been committed, if someone had done some misdemeanor, then he says, yeah, I would have dealt with that. But he says, uh, if it's a question, verse 15, if it's just a question of words and names and of your law, look you to it, for I will be no judge of such matters, and he drove them, he drove them from the synagogue, case dismissed, clear the court, get out. You know, it's, you, you, we, we're needing judges like that in our land. Men that will stand up and rather get involved in, 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 in all this uh, uh, politically correct niceties that are all around us, if they would just stand for truth and realize that their responsibility is to deal with misdemeanors, it's to deal with crimes rather than inventing crimes that they can then uh, lay up and pe- lay to the charge of people. You know, Galilee says, I'm not getting involved in, in, in religious things. I'm not getting involved in disputes about words and disputes about laws. I'm here, I'm here just to uphold the law of the land. And so the, kill, the, course, the, the case was dismissed, but it's interesting. Uh, and I'm just really hurrying to try and finish this. Uh, it said that um, the Greek stood Sosthenes the chief ruler of the synagogue. So he must have uh, succeeded uh, uh, Crispus. Uh, and they beat him before the judgment seat. And Gallio cared for none of these things. He wasn't getting involved in religious things, matters of religion, matters of spiritual things. Leave that to the conscience of men, he's basically saying. Uh, the law doesn't get involved in that. And, and, and Sosthenes, it's interesting that you know, when Paul writes to the Corinthians, he speaks about Sosthenes. So there's a possibility that not only did Crispus, the chief of the synagogue, get saved, but Sosthenes gets saved as well. One gets saved as a result of Paul withdrawing from the synagogue. The other gets saved as a result of having been beaten by the streets, having opposed Paul, and then getting beaten by these Greeks, whoever they were. And then he comes to faith in the Lord Jesus, and he's mentioned uh, in, in Paul's first letter uh, to, to the Corinthians. And then in verse number 18, uh, we see Paul's uh, dedication to God. He made a vow. Now, I don't want to get into the, the details of the dispute about that, what this vow was. Uh, it says he's, he tarried for a wee while, and, and then he took his leave of the brethren, and he sailed to Syria having with him Priscilla and Aquila, having shorn his head in Sincrea, uh, uh, which was one of the harbour areas in Corinth, uh, for he had a vow, for he had a vow. Now, I don't know what that vow was. The important thing is, the Bible tells us, if we make a vow to God, make sure we keep it. Make sure we keep it. You know, so often we make vows, don't we? We sit in conference meetings or listen to kind of uh, eloquent preachers and and we, we're kind of moved in our heart and we make a vow and things are going to be different and I'm going to surrender all to Jesus. How many times have we been there? And, and you know, we just, we never, we never keep the vows. We never keep our promises to God. We make a promise to God, keep it. Paul made a promise to God, whatever it was. Maybe it's because of the promise that God made to him. God had promised, I'll be with you. And I've got much people in this place and, and there'll be no harm come to you. And maybe at that point, Paul made a vow to, to, to the Lord and said, Lord, if you do that, then I'll, I'll, I will be bold and I will preach your word and I will do that faithfully. And so at the end of that period of time, he cuts his hair that this period, of the, his vow has been kept. He has maintained his promise to God and he's moving on from Corinth. And he, his desire is to go to Jerusalem, as we, as, 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 as we know, and and uh, he comes initially to, to, to Ephesus and Priscilla and Aquila are there. 
uh, and he leaves them there and he will go on uh, to, 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 uh, to, to Jerusalem. Uh, he, he said, verse 20, uh, or verse 19, he reasons in the, the Jews in the synagogue uh, and then they desired him to, to wait for a longer time, but he consented not. He bade them farewell saying, I must by all means keep this feast uh, that comes in Jerusalem, but I will return again unto you if God will. And he sailed from Ephesus. And when he had landed at Caesarea and gone up and saluted the church, he went down to Antioch. Uh, he went up, up to Jerusalem. This is his fourth visit to Jerusalem uh, since he was converted. And it's all just covered in a couple of verses. He went up. He went up. doesn't even mention the place, but it would be Jerusalem, though. They spoke about going up to Jerusalem. Uh, so he went up. That was his aim. That was where he was going. Uh, and he saluted the church. Now, we don't know what else happened there, but then he, he leaves Jerusalem and he really commences his third missionary journey. And we notice that he goes uh, to Galatia and Phrygia and he strengthens the disciples. And then we're introduced to this fellow called Apollos from Alexandria. And again, we see the sovereign movements of God, individuals just being at the right place at the right time. And other individuals being there just to help them along in their spiritual journey, to bring them to a greater understanding of divine truth. But we'll just leave it there and, and maybe Callum will finish the last few verses of chapter 18 and take us into chapter 19 uh, next Lord's Day, God willing. So let's just